2006 Communications Forum series. I'm David Thorburn, director of the Communications Forum. I'm happy to see you all here. Uh, I would be happier if there were more of you, but I remind our guests that we are uh, uh, um, in touch with an international audience through our website and through and through the uh, audio recordings and now video rec video that are uh, archived on our site and. Uh, uh, we should reach we should reach a considerably larger audience than this than the folks who are here. And my hope is that, as is often the case with forums, some folks will be coming in as we speak. I'm going to be very brief in my introductions uh, because we have a full venue, and I'm hoping for a very exciting conversation. Robert Pinsky is the poet is the former poet laureate of the United States, the only one uh, the only man uh, poet in American history to serve three terms as poet laureate from 1997 to 2000. He's the poetry editor of the online journal Slate. He teaches in the writing program at Boston University and is the author of a series of remarkable books of poetry of which the most recent is Jersey Rain uh, and then a forthcoming chapbook about to appear, I think, later this month or next month, called First Things to Hand. One of his most recent publications, which we will have a chance to talk about a bit later in our conversation, is a, a very uh, interesting and in some ways surprising book for Robert Pinsky, a book called The Life of David. It's not about me, however. It's about the biblical King David, much to my dismay when he told me that. Uh, uh, also sitting at at, at our at our uh, uh, at our at our conversation table is my colleague from MIT, Todd Machover. He's the head of the Media Lab's uh, Hyper Instruments and Opera of the Future group. He's the creator of the Toy Symphony, an international music performance and education project, and is kind of a legend at MIT for his imaginative way of uh, bringing uh, 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 classical attitudes toward music together with new technologies and with uh, uh, experimental uh, forms of various kinds. Uh, we're going to begin today uh, by showing a fragment of an opera that Pinsky and Makover have collaborated on, and then they will talk about it. I thought I would just quickly uh, just show you a little bit about the opera, and then we'll uh, show you a couple of minutes of it. Uh, it's called Death and the Powers. And uh, Robert and I, I called Robert out of the blue uh, to see if he might want to collaborate on a project uh, several years ago. And uh, thank God he said yes. It's been a very, very interesting project. It's uh, still in process. Uh, Robert finished the libretto uh, about four or five months ago. And uh, so I've started on the music. Uh, it's a, a quite a wild project. Um, maybe we'll tell you a little bit about the story later. Uh, it's about a man. Do you, want, do you want to say two words about what the, what the story is? He's a billionaire, sort of a Rupert Murdoch hyphen Walt Disney character. He's a creative billionaire who is getting a kind it's of. Kind of like Robert, you know, it's, it's the. <laughs> kind of immortality by uh, having himself converted into software. He's leaving the meat machine and he's basically abstracting himself. And this has uh, implications for his family, who may or may not follow him into this state. And uh, also, because he's so rich for the world and the world economy. Um, and uh, the subtitle is A Robot Pageant. The whole show is put on by robots. And our robots won't look like any robots you've ever seen. And in fact, the biggest robot of all is, uh, is the set itself, because one of the ideas is that uh, this character, Simon Powers, decides that he wants to leave everything about himself in the world, even though he himself wants to leave. So he turns himself into his environment. And the stage itself is a big robot. It's made up of gigantic panels that move into different configurations, as you can see. Uh, the panels themselves look like a room at first, and then they start to vibrate and undulate. In fact, the floor does as well all the surfaces that you wouldn't expect come alive. And uh, somehow or other, we're going to make this stage sing. Haven't quite figured that out yet. Um, but characters, all kinds of unusual things happen with the characters as well. So objects that usually stay on the ground, like um, grand pianos, uh, don't. Uh, they float as well. So um, this is a scene with the uh, third wife, Evie, who um, floats and dances with Simon in the walls. And the piano uh, plays while it's in the air. Um, this is my favorite shot so far of the animation of the set because it also, the whole thing explodes and goes out into the audience. 
Don't sit in the front row for that one. We'll see. Um, and we're also collaborating with a few other wonderful people on this project. Cynthia Brazil, who works here in the Media Lab, is designing the robotics for the set and for a variety of objects. Um, Randy Weiner, who's a writer and a dramaturge, worked very closely with Robert to help craft the story. Um, the story's Robert's, but to get it just right for an opera, Randy was extremely helpful. Uh, Diane Paulus is the theatrical director, wonderful young New York-based director, who is uh, exceptional because she's very well known for her classical opera, Mozart and Monteverdi in particular. She also has a variety of uh, kind of cult hit off-Broadway shows in New York that have been running for a long time. The Donkey Show is one of them, if you've heard of it. And she also designs a lot of the theatricals for uh, Disney these days. And uh, Alex McDowell is the designer. He's the one who's helping us figure out how to make these walls feel like they're alive. He's uh, one of the very best uh, Hollywood film designers right now. He designs all of Spielberg's movies, including Minority Report, The Terminal, and uh, also does Tim Burton's movies. So he did Charlie and the Chocolate Factory and uh, Corpse Bride, if you've heard of those. Um, so we are starting to make this project now. It opens in two years in Monte Carlo. Uh, I'm starting to compose the music. We're designing the sets and building everything. And we put on a um, little sneak preview, which we're going to show you a teeny bit of right now in Monte Carlo in the fall. Um, if you look at the top left, the characters, these are the four main characters. Uh, the person on the, all the way on the left is uh, Evie, the third wife, uh, in the black dress. Uh, she's sung by um, Elizabeth Koish, who's a Boston-based mezzo-soprano. Uh, the person next to her, to her left, uh, holding the wheelchair, is uh, Nicholas, who's a kind of grad student, scientist, assistant to Simon Powers. And uh, he's the one who has the know-how to actually build this system. And uh, his role is sung by the tenor, Brian Groman. Uh, next to him uh, is Simon Powers, the main character, with the white shirt and his sleeves rolled up. Uh, he's sung by the baritone, James Maddalena, great singer, who if uh, any of you have seen any of John Adams' operas, uh, he, he originated the role of Richard Nixon in Nixon and China, for instance. And uh, on the end, wearing the black shirt and the skirt, is Miranda, uh, the daughter, who's about 12 years old. And uh, she's sung by a remarkable young singer, an 18-year-old uh, uh, New Yorker freshman at Manhattan School of Music uh, named Elizabeth Reiter. So now I'll just, uh, let's give you a tiny glimpse of what this is going to be like. Uh, this is a, the simplest possible set, uh, no set at all, just the performers. And I put together a little three-minute excerpt so you can hear it. So. Make that louder, please.
guess I should say I don't get on well. <laughs> you know, well. I don't see why you should say that. <laughs> yeah, really. Uh, <laughs> Great way to start. It would have, how you feel as a it would have appeared to David person. Moore if uh, Todd, uh, for the compressing this, he edited out my favorite part right at the beginning there. The first words that this guy sings are the beginning of Yeats' Seventh of his Antony. He says, once out of nature, I will never take my bodily form from any natural thing. And he says, da 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 The immortal William Butler Yeats with his bird, and he says something like, mechanical parakeet, yeah. mechanical parakeet. And he says golden amulet. And mechanical parakeet, and then he says, Yeats, you can have your bird. Yeats, and you edit it out the part where then Jimmy Madalena says, Yeats, I give you the bird. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't know if that was your delicacy, uh, Todd, but for the, uh, I would Lump an audience that's right. like David, I that would have. Yeah, that's right. Here yeah, we took out that. the obscenity. It's phenomenal. Yeah. <laughs> no, but it's, a, it's, an, it's an interesting, uh, uh, and in some ways, one would think of it as partly a problematic um, collaboration between someone who spends his time worrying about the nuances of vowel sounds and consonant sounds at the end of words, and then having it translated into this environment in which people sing it, it's surrounded by music. For me, there's a kind of freedom in the composition. I knew that uh, Todd was going to set these things to music. Um, I don't have a wide knowledge of modern music. I actually did know Todd's music. And uh, as you can tell, it's quite melodic and emotional. And it really is very referential for me. It's referential to all kinds of familiar music. So that uh, it's an exciting feeling for me, thank God we'll have super titles. My main problem with it is that as with heavy metal music, as with many kinds of music, it's hard to understand the words. And uh, I have never liked the art song if I know the poem. As you say, I'm thinking about the original music that is built into the vowels. And usually the less I know the poem, the better I like the art song. Hmm. And in this case, I had the freedom of, in effect, writing for this format. And uh, I, could, uh, I could throw in rhymes and false rhymes and little alliterations and feel it was like playing. It was, like a, it was the freedom of a rather new medium. So as a way of composing, but I had no confidence in my ability to make a good story for the stage. And that's where Randy Weiner was very useful. Um, almost as my psychiatrist, saying, well, we can make this work. Um, I had the, what Todd has done with the words is very beautiful to me, very expressive. And it was not, I, I was not saying goodbye to poetry. I can write a poem whenever I like or whenever I can. Uh, it was adding this other kind of composition, which I found very liberating, very pleasurable. Talk a little bit about the um, sequence of, of the work. Robert did all his work first, and then you work from that text, is that? Yeah, but usually, so I have always liked, uh, not just liked, but I, I think I write best to text, and I probably write melody more naturally than other things as well. Um, and so I'm also very inspired by text, so I, for a piece like this, I thought a lot about it, had many, many ideas, but nothing was absolutely specific until I, I saw, not just saw, some words, but saw the words. So, um, but Robert and I spent a huge amount of time together over those, you know, a few years actually, talking about the story and talking about specific text. And then, uh, you know, sometimes we worked together. Sometimes Robert worked with Randy. Um, but I didn't write a note of music until, um, again, not until there were sections. But I usually like to imagine the whole shape of of a thing and the personality of a piece and of these characters. So. Um, I got the whole libretto and then really dug in. That's when I started writing. Um, I do hope that people, I, I think the sound system in here is awful. Um, I, my, my goal, I think the text. The lights ain't that great either. But <laughs> There's a lot of ethnic humor, and <laughs> political allusions. Todd is leaving out a false start in which we wrote an aria. There's only one false start. There we went to Monaco. We had a soprano who sang the aria. Uh, at the, uh, for the people in Monaco. Um, 
And with that false start and with this project so far, Todd will email me and say something like, there are a lot of syllables right here. Can you find a way to use fewer syllables? And I because pride myself music, on Because the music requires Well, of course, the exigencies of needing to compose music for it. Is that a fair paraphrase? I mean, I, I'm sort of forgetting the things. Some things like that. But yeah. Can I use a simpler word here? Instead of a longer word, simpler word, longer word. I know you just never, you know, you never know what's going to come up. Some it's part little of it's tinkering, and um, I think in every case I've responded by saying no, but this. <laughs> that is, in every case I said, well, not that fix, but how about this fix? And I think the fixes have been appropriate. Yeah, yeah. I think, and often it goes back a few times, but um, yeah. So there has been a process of uh, collaboration on that level where. This won't work here like this. Can we try that? I'll say, well, A wasn't any good. B wasn't any good. How about B prime or C? Yeah, and, and, and I think I think probably that's the way you like to work. But especially with with a project like this, where it's not a you know a fixed poem, it's it's also incredibly liberating for me because um, you can start writing the music and see. Oh, I remember something that came up in this section was um, it's not always easy ahead of time. I, th I think in the old days you could plan out the structure of an opera and say, OK, I need a trio here, and I need a duet here, and here we bring everybody in. Mm -hmm. This, I think, w was more fluid. We knew we were, we were setting up characters and situations. But as I'm writing it, you, know, you, you say, well, here's a place. We really do have to have these people be together. You know, we they, made a quartet out of what had been part of a, a, a monologue. Uh, I remember now, there was things that Simon said and we just changed them a little, and we made them. Uh, you got a little glimpse of some of the. Uh, uh, we didn't quite get the quartet, but we got a trio. A trio. And uh, but it does become a quartet it, right before the yep. close of the scene. Yep. And when you heard that trio, you were hearing words that I had originally written for one character. Partly because uh, I am a complete beginner at doing this, and uh, it didn't take us long to, to to turn it into a trio. How long do you think the entire project will be. How long will, it, will the production be, do you think? Uh, you'll wake up and you'll, it'll be as though it was two minutes. <laughs> I'm sure that's true. Not him, no. You might have a hard time. Um, our goal is I've done different kinds of operas. That only happens when I read your poems. Not that <laughs> <laughs> the, the goal is to have uh, no intermission. So you, know, you can't have more than eight or nine hours, something right. like that. No, no, it's probably an, an hour and a half without a break is the idea. Maybe, maybe a little longer. I mean, it's, now that, again, now that we're starting, when you look at the text, it reads quickly. It's very elegant, beautiful. Um, but when you know when you spend time with it and make these characters real, there's there's a lot going on, and there are there are a lot of changes in characters, a lot of um, a lot of beautiful words that you don't want to just run through. So. There, there are links to this project on the communications forum website, and I assume Todd also from from your own. Uh, Website. I think there probably are. Uh, yeah. So those of you who want to sort of pursue this and look more, find out more about this project, it's available. Have you have we been able to put anything online yet uh, of the fragments that you've completed? Uh, no, I haven't. Uh, haven't wanted to put those online yet. But um, there's some good text on the opera online, and pictures, and uh, there's amazing amount of um, set design, wonderful graphics. Uh, we're working on them again next week. So I would say. Pretty soon they'll be, actually I'll probably put up a website on this. I don't like putting, I, excerpts of things that aren't finished, I usually don't like to make public. There's something about collaboration, and it sounds like the website does uh, dramatize these different elements that are coming together. I'm thrilled when I first hear the music, and I was thrilled when I saw Alex's set designs. I mean, Alex really is very, very good. And uh, when I first saw those walls breathe, and when we started talking about um, things floating and that there are ways to do it, and that then this whole, it's an organism that is an expression of this man's consciousness. And then when it goes and all goes out over the audience, and it can be done. And the robots <laughs> can be done. Or we not. hope so. Yeah, we're trying. The robots, you know, they're not going to look like uh, stainless steel department store dummies. They're not going to look like Robert the Robot or some post-war Japanese thing. They're largely made out of light. And they come on as one thing. And they have lights on them. And then they devolve into the separate 
robots who will become the characters. Actually, you didn't say anything about the robot prologue. You know, I just, that's a pretty unusual. In the robot prologue, um, they say, they come out you know, the and robot prologue. with the head <laughs> robot, after they come apart, the head robot says or sings, well, the human creators did instruct us, the human creators back in the organic age instructed us to perform this a certain times, and so we're going to do it. And one of the other robots says, but I don't get it. This thing, <laughs> death, it's supposed to be so important. Is it like lost data? But there's always data can always be recovered. I, I, I don't get it. He says, it doesn't matter. We're going to do it. And then uh, they discuss it, and then they gradually become the singers we're going to see. And you, the light it makes it possible to do that. Then at the end, after our big finish, they recoalesce. But before they read, one of the robots says, was that it? <laughs> uh, I, I still don't really understand why we did this. What is that about? And the head robot says, I know what you mean, but uh, everybody who participates gets 10,000 human rights credits. <laughs> and uh, they turn back into this thing. So there's a backstory that is partly filled in, which is where did we go? Where did the human creators go? And what form of, quote, life, end quote, is persisting in the form of these robots who are performing basically a kind of a ritual, as with the origins of drama. And uh, a, a thing we've arrived at for that is that when the robots say this to one another, there'll be supertitles where you get it in English, but they're speaking robot to one another. So they say, smarnet and fanden, dork and thassen state, written stood. So the other one says, Britain is too dark and Latin flying for Stabin. For Stabin, Otten, Dorden? Dorden, Otten, Resin, Stuben, Dabin. Or Raffin, Stabin. And then you're maybe getting we, that. Maybe we should subtitles. continue like this. It's actually, it's actually very interesting. <laughs> Some of you I know who know a robot were laughing. Right, right, yeah. right. right. The, the native robot speakers won't find this that interesting. Todd, thank you very much. It looks like a wonderful project, and we're, we thank you for taking part today. Thank you. Yeah, we premiere this in about two years, so we'll let you know. Okay. Come to Monte Carlo. And, uh, Fred and Stortle Band. <laughs> See you there. <laughs> you Thank you. You're going to do the favorite thing. We're going to, we're going to try to uh, have a conversation for about another half hour, and then we'll open the we floor to general out. discussion. Uh, I thought the conversation would be helpful because we could cover a number of aspects of Pinsky's uh, immensely diverse, intimidatingly diverse portfolio. Uh, and, and one of the most important aspects of his recent uh, work has, has been another form of outreach that I'm sure many of you know about, uh, and uh, Robert and I have talked about it many times. It's, it's, uh, uh, I guess it's a project that he started when he was the Poet Laureate, and I'll let him describe it. It's the Favorite Poem Project, and we're going to have a clip or two to show you. Will you talk a little about it, Robert? I invited Americans to uh, write me a letter or an email saying the title and author of a poem that the person writing loved and would be willing to read for a national archive. My advertising budget was about $7. <laughs> I received tens of thousands of responses. There is a book for sale outside called An Invitation to Poetry. It has a DVD in the back that has about 25 of the video segments about on which I'm about to show you a couple. And if anybody here teaches or knows a teacher, I really urge you to buy the book, if only for the DVD. I think you'll see what I mean. Um, you want to do the Whitman first? Well, look at a couple of the, uh, of the segments on that uh, DVD that is in the back of the, uh, back of the book. And yeah, why not start with a sort of a flagship one, a track, uh, Track six. Um, these are maybe four minute, three minute uh, video segments. Is there a way to get these lights down? My name's John Doherty. I'm from Braintree, Massachusetts, 34 years old, and I'm a construction worker for the Boston Gas Company. We do outside construction work providing natural gas for residents or businesses. So uh, a lot of um, 
digging, laying pipelines, is it loud gas enough? mains, all outdoor work. The satisfying thing about the job is you're working with a dangerous element, really. So it's it's important to be exact in everything you do. You certainly don't want to leave any kind of a gas leak behind. So um, you know you have to be careful. You have to pay attention. Poetry was was definitely intimidating initially. Uh, it just looked like a lot of words and that were out of order and out of place and uh, did not belong together. And that's, that's the challenge of it. It just takes a lot of reading and rereading to grasp it. But once you do, once you come to understand it, you've achieved something. So now you feel good. Song of Myself is a poem that I probably had a lot of difficulty understanding the first time. And there were certain lines that caught me and that I liked. And when I got to the very end of this very long poem, um, the last half dozen lines, uh, so encouraging. He, in those last few lines, Whitman tells you what you're thinking. He says that you probably didn't understand what you just read, <laughs> but stay with it, and you will, and you'll love it. And so it felt like it was speaking directly to me when I first read it, and I keep those lines in mind no matter what I read now. The connection I feel with Walt Whitman's poem, Song of Myself, is not due to the fact that he talks about laborers, physical labor working outside, and like the common working American. Uh, that's a nice touch in it, of course, but I enjoyed it for its, its upliftingness, its, its ability to inspire me and, and see things in life and in everyday existence that I hadn't noticed before, that I might have taken it for granted before. Song of Myself by Walt Whitman. There is that in me. I do not know what it is, but I know it is in me. Wrenched and sweaty, calm and cool, then my body becomes. I sleep. I sleep long. I do not know it. It is without name. It is a word unsaid. It is not in any dictionary, utterance, symbol. Something it swings on more than the earth I swing on. To it, the creation is the friend whose embracing awakes me. Perhaps I might tell more. Outlines. I plead for my brothers and sisters. Do you see, oh my brothers and sisters? It is not chaos or death. It is form, union, plan. It is eternal life. It is happiness. The spotted hawk swoops by and accuses me. He complains of my gab and my loitering. I too am not a bit tamed. I too am untranslatable. I sound my barbaric yop over the roofs of the world. The last scud of day holds back for me. It flings my likeness after the rest, and true as any on the shadowed wilds. It coaxes me to the vapor and the dusk. I depart as air. I shake my white locks at the runaway sun. I effuse my flesh in eddies and drift it in lacy jags. I bequeath myself to the dirt to grow from the grass I love. If you want me again, look for me under your boot soles. You will hardly know who I am or what I mean, but I shall be good health to you nevertheless and filter and fiber your blood. Failing to fetch me at first, keep encouraged. Missing me one place, search another. I stop somewhere waiting for you. Okay, shut it off. Thank you. If we have, some, have the lights come up. Could we see the audience? The filmmaker, the filmmakers were independent uh, producer directors around the country, so we didn't have to pay transportation costs. We brought them here for a film school, and my uh, executive. Uh, producer Juanita Anderson told them about uh, the Library of Shots, uh, 
what kind of uh, video they're going to use, lenses. And I talked to them about the project. And we had a favorite poem reading at BU, in which we had a college president and a grade school kid and a high school kid and an art director and an elderly person. We had a reading with a kind of range, which we can't demonstrate with one video. But the point is partly a very great range of people, not particularly poets or professors of poetry. Uh, Robert, let's talk a little bit about, about the, 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 um, dem the democratic implications of this. I mean, clearly, one of the implications of the whole project is to say poetry should be, we shouldn't think of poetry as a kind of elite activity which only professors and poet tasters like, but that it's something that, that ordinary people can enjoy and, and, and experience, that poetry belongs to everyone. But of course, there are plenty of poets who think that this is sort of selling out. What we could put it differently. That? We could say we're establishing a true elite of people who understand a poem, have incorporated, can read it aloud in a way that other people can uh, perceive it, uh, against the false elite of people who get tenure at Yale or Harvard or BU or somewhere, and often don't know anything about what a poem actually is. So um, it's a it's a, a, the elitism is the elitism of people who are actually responding to a poem in a way that can be communicated to another person, which is very fundamental to the art of poetry. And it substitutes for a couple of elites. There's the academic elite, which sometimes really not very close to the nature of the art of poetry. And in our country, what the most true elite in American culture is an elite based on performers. So that instead of kings and queens and dukes and earls and duchesses, we have singers and actors and athletes. This is a great improvement. <laughs> Far better to uh, idealize somebody because they can throw a ball like hell or they're beautiful or they can sing and dance very well than because of who their great-great-grandparents were. But this is different from either the academic world or the media world of celebrity. This is an art in which each individual, the reader's body, the reader's breath, is the medium. Walt Whitman is dead. John Doherty is alive. John Doherty's breath, saying those words by Whitman, become Whitman's medium. It's not Whitman being read by an actor. It's not Whitman himself giving a terrific poetry reading on the poetry reading circuit. It is the reader's realization, literal realization of the poem. And yes, I think that in a democracy, the idea of an art in which not the performer, but each, uh, an art that is inherently on a human scale, on the scale of one person, I love digital media. This is a digital medium itself. But the medium that is also human and bodily, as in the subject of the opera, there's a certain respect for that. And I think there are ways you could argue that in a democracy, uh, this ancient art, which in some ways has non-democratic origins, courtly origins, has an important function because it inherently respects what used to be called the dignity of the individual. Do you remember the J.V. Cunningham poem that talks about breathes on the words he made? It's sort of an embodiment of your... I couldn't quote it, but yes. It was a test. You were supposed to be able to quote it. <laughs> the artist is dead, but the reader's breath, literal or imaginary, because it might not be reading aloud. It might be just hearing it in your mind's ear. Um, that is your particular I mean, this is a form of possession by the dead. If John Doherty reads that, or I, David reads the Cunningham, or I read a Ben Jonson, um, that sliver of that original consciousness is being realized in the new person's breath. But it can, it can it also be realized, Robert, just in reading? Why do I have to read it aloud to reanimate it? Poetry is an art that takes for its material. Uh, the sounds of a language. And um, if you are, Ezra Pound said poetry is a centaur, by which he means in prose you fire an arrow at a target. In poetry you do the same thing, but you're riding a horse at the same time. And the horse I take to be the human body, the bodily part of poetry. 
So if you're reading a poem and not hearing it at all, as far as I'm concerned, you're missing an important part of it. Also true, if you're stupid, you won't get it all. It is an art of the mind and of the body. And every art that I can think of in some way uses something physical. You know, music uses physical sounds. Um, film is a physical phenomenon that you, 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 you take in visually and, and auditorily, you know, all plastic art, uh, visual arts. And poetry also has a physical, bodily component, and that is the sounds of the words. Let's uh, uh, show you one more fragment from this, and then we'll go on to some other discussion. We can come back to these. But Robert, make it, make, did, could, could I nominate one? Because sure. I think she actually starts reading right away, and I'd rather just hear the read. Could we do number four? And I think, I think she actually reads the poem in the beginning, or recites the beginning poem in the beginning. Beginning and the end, star. I think. So let's just look at the rec recitation in the beginning and not watch the whole, unless you think it's valuable. I thought we would just I don't want to watch only part of one of them. You want to watch, watch the whole thing? Someone. All right. All right, it's your, it's your project. I'll, I'll go through with this, with this tedious idea. Go ahead. <laughs> Actually, it's a very, this is my favorite of all of the, of all of the. Theodore Rescue. In moving slow, he has no peer. You ask him something go in back his to the ear, of the track. We he missed thinks about it for a year. I interrupted her. The Sloth by Theodore Rescue. In moving slow, he has no peer. You ask him something in his ear, he thinks about it for a year. And then, before he says a word, there, upside down, unlike a bird, he will assume that you have heard. A most exasperating lug. But should you call his manner smug? He'll sigh and give his branch a hug. Then off again to sleep he goes, still swaying gently by his toes. And you just know, he knows, he knows. I'm Catherine Meckling, I'm 11 years old, I live it's in Lexington, oh, right, Massachusetts, stop. and I'm in the fifth She's grade. actually very charming, and at the end of this fragment, she reads it again, she recites it again, even more remarkably. Uh, she analyzes but, the sentence. But I'd rather hear Robert than his, than his uh, uh, She uh, says that she likes the, the line, still swaying gently by his toes. She says quite correctly that it's anamatopoetic. She doesn't use that word, but she says it, it's like you can see him swinging there. Um, I don't mean to deprecate the entire academic profession of the study of literature, <laughs> but it is true that often you will hear an extremely celebrated uh, grand professor or professora give a lecture, and when the person reads parts of the poems, you realize the person is not hearing the poems. Um, this is not incidental or ornamental, and it's not histrionic skill. It's not being an actor. These are not trained uh, actors. But it's a little bit like music or dancing. You're either doing it or not. I mean, you can tell when someone just is not, not hearing it. And so uh, I say that partly mischievously, but partly to say that it's not all about democracy or the people. There also is something exacting about art. And uh, every art has its techniques and its demands, and uh, it's, uh, it can be quite stringent. And, uh, it's not just, isn't it cute that a child or a construction worker is reading a poem. The things they say about the poems, in every case, I think, uh, are cogent. Uh, the, uh, the book prints 200 poems, and there's a quotation from a letter that I got next to each poem. And we tried to choose things that were quite illuminating. Uh, so um, there's an aspect of the project that I'm happy to say is elitist, as well as clearly an aspect that is democratic, too. I was the editor. I chose which letters I thought were very good. And though the poems included don't represent my taste exactly, there aren't the poems I would have chosen, they do represent my standards. If a poem was not up to my standards, we didn't put it in an anthology, we didn't make a video of it. Casey at the Bat. Casey at the Bat, perhaps an exception, but it's a very good piece of uh, pop art. Uh, yeah. And the kid does do it very well. Well, I'm glad you're 
in favor of some aspects of pop art. I'd, li I'd like to make a quick transition. We don't have a lot of time, and I want to give the audience a chance at you. But there are at least two topics that I want us to talk a little bit about, Robert. And one of them is what has always struck me as one of the most remarkable and interesting things about your career. I, uh, um, a brief background. Uh, when Robert first began to publish, uh, he was immensely influential as a, uh, even as a young poet because he seemed to be doing something at the time that was new, in quotes, in the sense that the uh, established line in poetry was elsewhere. And what was new, essentially, was how deeply conversational his early poetry was. And his first few books of poetry uh, uh, not only had a kind of conversational feel, but they were, but they were, uh, and 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 a kind of uh, syntactic coherence that was close, in some respects, closer to prose than it was to poetry. Uh, although they were very sort of uh, thought through and careful poems, they were true poems. There was this not exactly prosaic, but conversational dimension to Robert's early poetry, uh, and especially in the in in the book. Uh, 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 entitled An Explanation of America. But as, his, as, as you've gone on, though, uh, uh, your, your poetry has changed in somewhat radical ways and uh, in somewhat surprising ways. And there have been some essays written about this, which, I, which I've learned from uh, uh, studying uh, uh, Robert's work at different st stages of his career. But to oversimplify, his, his work becomes less and less conversational. It becomes harder, I think, more difficult, sometimes harder to follow. You have to work harder to get the meaning, although I think he's always an accessible poet. Uh, and he moves toward a condition in which he seems to be writing something closer to incantation than conversation. And there's a deeply sort of uh, uh, incantatory and visionary dimension to his most recent poetry. And many people have, many people have commented on this. But the, my first question is, do you, do you remember a moment in your own work when you felt a turning like that? I mean, I know of some poems I might nominate, but I was yeah. wondering if you felt a moment where you were changing. It's so hard to write a good poem. And you die not knowing if you ever have. I mean, if you want to know that you've done something right, you must become something like a, a surgeon or an airline pilot. Really, seriously, then you know, you know, you you flew, you're, you 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 performed the mission to, to do with the surgery, or the, you know, you have a, a much more objective measure than if you're an artist. Uh, earlier to the students, earlier I quoted uh, Keats's epitaph that he wrote for himself: "Here lies one whose name was written water." Part of him knew or suspected that he was John Keats that people like us would be reading his words hundreds of years later. But since he wasn't a madman, he also admitted the possibility perhaps his life had been in vain. He had not written masterpieces. And when he thought he did or had, it was a delusion. And being a genius, he wrote a brilliant epitaph that covers both cases. <laughs> it's ironic if he is John Keats, and it is a very moving evocation of what it is to have your name be written water, if not. It's so hard to write a good poem that when you are trying to do it, what you are thinking about is how you can possibly approach that goal. So you're not thinking about, well, I've done the conversational thing. I think it's time to be a little more incantational. You're, you're, much, more, you're much more like somebody See, that's exactly how I thought it would trying, be. To keep, <laughs> trying to keep an airplane in the air or trying to um, uh, uh, save the patient. You know, you're, you're just desperately, you know, very intensely trying to make something that works. Um, it's also true that uh, explanation of America is spoken to a, to it's, and it's spoken fictionally to a child between the ages of eight and eleven, um, and almost because of that, it, it, it's a book-length poem with a little prefatory poem that is rather imagistic and um, yeah, is. Uh, more incantational, and uh, a poem at the end uh, that is also much less conversational and more like a, a, a litany or a prayer. Uh, I wasn't consciously saying, look, I can do that too. But it seemed an appropriate way to say, this is a little bit like um, I'm writing a concerto, minor keys are involved. Another time I might be writing a song cycle, or this isn't a major key, that there is not only development, there's also different tasks. At some point, it is true, I fell in love with the substantive. And this is, I mean grammatically. And this is like talking about um, nuts and bolts. 
I had been very much in love with very complicated sentences, like the first sentence of George Herbert's poem, Church Monuments. The man is about to go to pray, and he stops in the graveyard outside the church, and he addresses his body, and he says, the soul's going to go and pray now. Body, little child, you be good. Stay out here and look at this. You're going to learn something from it. While that my soul repairs to her devotion, here I entomb my flesh, that at bay times may take acquaintance of these heaps of dust, to which the blast of death's incessant motion, fed by the exhalation of our crimes, drives all at last. You know, you diagram it on the, on the blackboard. It's, it's like a spidery thing, but how beautiful the energy is directed. While that my soul repairs her devotion, here I entomb my flesh, that it be times may take acquaintance of these heaps of dust, to which the blast of death's incessant motion, fed by the exhalation of our crimes, drives all at last. I once asked a lot of doctoral students at Berkeley, what's the main verb of that sentence? <laughs> Some of them said, drives? No, F. It is in. Isn't it great? Everything grows off in tomb. The poem is called Church Monuments. So part of oneself, technically, is in love with the idea of how much energy syntax generates. And it's taking the rhymes as it goes. And it's taking the line endings as it goes. And then at some point, you've been doing that a lot, those long sentences. And at some point, you know, you're probably thinking about shirt, where the Southerns is coming with the articles. Um, the yoke, the back. The needle, the treadle. Let, let, and, this is, this is one of Robert's most famous poems. It's a prize-winning poem called Shirt. Maybe you should read it, Robert. Uh, maybe, but why don't you read it? short poem. So, but describe it and then read it. Substance. I mean, that poem, in fact, goes all over the lot intellectually. The things I've read, the thing, I, I, you know, I plagiarize a little bit of a thing here, and I have another idea I got from there. Um, but the poem is sort of dominated by that the sense of substantives, in that case with the article, the this, the this, the that. And there's, an, there's a power to that. It's a kind of inventory. Sentence Since he doesn't want to read it, it's a kind of inventory. I'll, I'll, I'll read it. But Thank it, you. I'm, <laughs> See, he would be much more cooperative it's, if I wasn't his friend. It's what friends are for. It's so nice. Oh, no, I mustn't. No, no. <laughs> you know, I Thank threatened you, him. He's not behaving well. If he doesn't behave better, I'm going to recite some of his suppressed poetry that he I wrote said to, a teenager. I said to David, uh, keep enticing me. Tell me to read shirt, and I'll pretend I don't want to. And keep <laughs> begging me to do it. Shirt. The back. The yoke. The yardage. Lapped seams. The nearly invisible stitches along the collar turned in a sweatshop by Koreans or Malaysians gossiping over tea and noodles on their break, or talking money or politics, while one fitted this arm piece with its overseam to the band of cuff I button at my wrist. The presser, the cutter, the ringer, the mangle, the needle, the union, the treadle, the bobbin, the code. The infamous blaze at the Triangle Factory in 1911. 146 died in the flames on the ninth floor. No hydrants, no fire escapes. The witness in the building across the street who watched how a young man helped a girl to step up to the windowsill, then held her out away from the masonry wall and let her drop. And then another, as if he were helping them up to enter a streetcar, and not eternity. A third, before he dropped her, put her arms around his neck and kissed him. Then he held her into space and dropped her. Almost at once, he stepped to the sill himself. His jacket flared and fluttered up from his shirt as he came down, air filling up the legs of his gray trousers, like Hart Crane's bedlamite. Shrill shirt ballooning. Wonderful how the pattern matches perfectly across the placket and over the twin bar tacked corners of both pockets, like a strict rhyme or a major chord. Prints, plaids, checks, houndstooth, tattersall, madras, the clan tartans invented by mill owners, inspired by the hoax of Ashen to control their savage Scottish workers, tamed 
by a fabricated heraldry, McGregor, Bailey, McMartin. The kilt devised for workers to wear among the dusty clattering looms, weavers, carters, spinners, the loader, the docker, the navvy, the planter, the picker, the sorter sweating at her machine in a litter of cotton as slaves in calico head rags sweated in fields. George Herbert, your descendant, is a black lady in South Carolina. Her name is Irma, and she inspected my shirt. Its color and fit and feel and its clean smell have satisfied both her and me. We have culled its cost and quality down to the buttons of simulated bone, the button holes, the sizing, the facing, the characters printed in black on neckband and tail, the shape, the label, the labor, the color, the shade, the shirt. Thank you, Robert. Thank you. The later poems become even more visionary, and we may have a chance to look at those a little bit later. But I want to make a transition to the final topic we'll discuss before we open to, the, to general discussion. And that is this mo recent prose book that Robert has written called The Life of David. Uh, I've read it closely and been deeply moved by it. And it strikes me that one of the interesting things about the book, it is like a vast Pinsky poem. That is to say, uh, it's full of disparate energies that seem to sort of uh, uh, create a, a, at least a, 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 the illusion of, 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 of an absence of coherence. But when you finally, when you finish the whole, you realize how richly coherent it is. Uh, and it is in some degree a kind of departure for uh, a, a poet like Robert Pinsky to turn to this sort of a book. It's a, 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 I, I thought that first, Robert, I might ask you to sort of, in a, just a general way, describe how you, uh, wh why you felt that, that David was such a fascinating figure, wh why he mattered to you in a way. Um, I'll try to unite the two subjects, the previous subject okay. and this one. Syntax in poetry is the equivalent of melody in music. It connects things over time. It's the equivalent, perhaps, of harmonic structure, but even more of melody, so that any good syntax is in some sense conversational, that it converts and it's between. Uh, so that sometimes when people are talking, they talk and rather like, while that my soul repairs the devotion, here my still my flesh because it's the times, but and there are other times when it is more also conversational when it's no hydrant, no fire escapes. Yeats says in a letter, it is the syntax of in memoriam that is odious. It is the language of no man when moved. Our teacher Winters says somewhere else about poetry he doesn't like, something one would never say moving in a certain way. On some level, it has to seem like some, even if the person were muttering it to themselves, it's what connects part to part. And to say no hydrants, no fire escapes, is to emphasize minimal connection. And to say, wow, that my soul repairs the ocean. Here I am to make that connect suggests very, very almost in prepping, elaborate. Hypotactic and paratactic syntax are the rhetorical terms. The David book is in a way about being Jewish. It's about what is a Jew. And Jews, through an historical destiny, are highly syncretic. You might even say synthetic in the sense of synthesis. And connecting one thing to another thing you know, it's been said, one of the things people say about Jews is if you go to Chile or if you go to Romania or if you go to Alabama, in Alabama the most Chilean Chilenos are the Jews. That they are extremely adaptable in some sense. So that in this country, Irving Berlin, who was born in Russia uh, and had a longer name than Berlin at one point, uh, wrote White Christmas. And Having succeeded at that, he also wrote Easter Parade. Um, David, for s interesting reasons we can speculate about, rather than Abraham, is the quintessential hero of these people. And Abraham is the father. He's the first Jew. David, his, his, some of the rabbis say, is he really Jewish? Should he sit among the Jews? His great-grandmother was Ruth, uh, a Moabite woman. 
My chapter about Goliath is uh, titled Cousin Goliath. Um, I point out with delight in the last chapter that the six-pointed star is of David only by the most imaginative process he never heard. If there was an actual person there, it wasn't until really what they now call early modern Europe, it wasn't until like the 14th, 15th century, that that symbol of six-pointed star was connected with Jews. It's a great symbol. The two triangles, the male dagger pointing to the sky embraces the earth. The female chalice open to the sky points to the earth. So it's a yin-yang symbol. And David, too, is all of the above. He's a great killer. He's a great poet. He's an artist. He's a politician. He's a terrible person. He's a great person. He has this, he connects many things. He is very disparate. And just as one is interested technically in all the many, many ways that one word is connected to another word, all the varieties of syntax. And no two grammatical junctures are exactly the same. Even if you write a line like tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow, each and and each tomorrow has a slightly different character. Each juncture is a slightly different juncture because the pressure of repetition varies through the course of the line. And just as one might be uh, fascinated by all the infinite range of grammatical junctures and connections, uh, one is interested in the yin and yang, the inclusive. Did I do that dagger chalice thing right? Female chalice points to the earth. The male dagger uh, points to the sky. Right. Yeah, I'm OK. Yes, you were right. <laughs> um, it is all of the above. The quality of David to be all of the above, the quality of the Jews to be all of the above, are related in my line, mind to the ambition of writing a kind of poetry in which anything can be included. Well, the, the, the David book um, is perhaps less capacious than some of the poems because not everything is included, it, relevant. But it is a kind of very imaginative uh, retelling of the David story that goes beyond the Bible in some respects. I thought maybe we should, uh, you might mention something about uh, uh, some of the other homework you did when you were working on the book. It was it so you... easy to do the homework because uh, Louis Ginsberg compiled this great, great compilation called The Legends of the Jews. It's all of the crazy, weird midrashes, all of the stories, and he arranges it by character. So all the things about David are right there. And uh, they are many, and they are very, very uh, weird. The one that I'll tell the, uh, the quickly, the one that epitomizes what I just said about inclusiveness. David was not supposed to live his full 70 years, as he did. His original destiny was to die as an infant. But Adam happened to be walking around in the part of heaven where the souls are waiting to be born. He saw David's soul and he said, whoa, that's a great soul. That, that kid is fantastic. That soul shouldn't die. Oh, he should have a whole life. Fortunately, God is in that part of heaven too. <laughs> and David's and there and waiting to be born and Adam says to God, oh, that that kid should have a whole, he's, that's a great soul. You, you gave me a 1,000 years to live. I'll give him 70 of my years. So God calls up the lawyer angels. They write up a contract. The undersigned Adam, the hereby, believe it, the year of 70. And David gets to live a whole. Well, this is Adam, who's the seed. All the potential good and bad and glorious and various things that we can do. He's, he's the seed of all of us. And he recognizes the soul. That is all of the above. So he's all of the above in, in, in potential. He recognizes the life that has come closest to the fruition or flowering of everything that a person might be. And that's not biblical. That's some manic rabbi made that up. <laughs> it's a it's, cer it's, certainly, it's, it, it's, it's certainly a book that will surprise you. Even if you have no interest in the Bible or in David, <laughs> you'll find this a, a remarkable book. And there's a turning at the end that I think we could conclude on. I'd like to ask you, Robert, to read the very end of the book. Because uh, okay. do you have, I have a copy if you need it. Um, there, there is um, uh, 
very little hint of an autobiographical dimension to the book, unlike many of Robert's poems, which always have at least a kind of hint of a, of a, of a personal engagement. Uh, but the autobiographical element emerges with astonishing clarity and, and poignance at the very end of the book. And that's the part of the book that I'm asking Robert to look at. Here. OK. David is more enigmatic than any purely Christian or Jewish paradigm, more tangled at the roots and more proliferating, larger. An enduring story of stories necessarily involves quirks and guises, a paradoxical incrustation of Midrash. For example, the six-pointed figure known as the Star of David was pretty certainly unknown to David, though Gregory Peck wears the image on his tunic in David and Bathsheba. The six-pointed star was not associated with King David nor with Jews until more than a 1,000 years after the time of David. The star is of David. The Psalms are of David. The very stories in the Hebrew Bible and in the legends are of David or are of him by sovereign possessive force of attribution beyond scholarly demonstration. In their different ways and degrees, all rotating around David's genitive central energy that attracts and embraces them. In the Roman Forum on the triumphal arch of the Emperor Titus celebrating his capture and destruction of Jerusalem a millennium after its founding, the branched candelabrum appears, but not the anachronistic star. It is not mentioned in the Bible, nor in the Talmud, nor in the rabbinical literature. The first Jewish source to mention the stars in the 13th century of the Common Era, uh, symbol doesn't appear to be much used before the 15th century. The Jewish Encyclopedia says it probably was the Kabbalah that derived the symbol from the Templars. I'll skip the paragraph I've already paraphrased to you about the male dagger and the female chalice. The Star of David's history has been far from uniformly sweet. When the Portuguese monarch Afonso IV reserved, reversed his predecessor's benign policies, all Jews were forbidden to appear in public without a visible six-pointed yellow star on their hat or coat. In this regard, the Nazis again appear as not originators, but copiers, adapters, exploiters, and refiners. Continuing and extending the theme of inclusion, Gershom Scholem, in his essay on the star, commends the wisdom of converting the symbol of oppression into an insignia of national identity. On the flag of Israel, and as a glyph unmistakable as the cross, the stringent geometry of the star in the way of human makings accepts but transfigures its range of meanings. Here is a particular instance, a photograph of 12 young men taken in the bad year 1939. Sewn onto their uniforms is that six-pointed star of interlocked triangles, said to be borrowed from a device of the Knights Templar and incorporated without rabbinic approval into the agonized mysticisms and pedantries of Kabbalah. The young men squinting back at the camera are named Ralph Binder, Joseph Siegel, Nathan Schneider, Morris Newberg, Herman Schneider, Gilbert Kaplan, Harry Silver, David Becker, Milton Silver, Milford Pinsky, Abraham Baum, and Seymour Barron. They are the Jewish aces in shorts, knee pads, and basketball shoes. One of them holds a basketball on which someone has painted City Champs, 1938-1939. Another cradles the trophy with its crowning figure of an athlete holding the ball overhead in the trophy maker's stylized gesture of attainment in plated metal. They are standing in front of their high school in Long Branch, New Jersey. 1939. The group picture is an interesting artifact because of the apparent wacky or tragic incongruity of that six-pointed emblem deployed in Europe for such different purposes, far more like those of King Afonso, at the moment the photograph was taken. The players of the Jewish aces were most likely far from unaware of the laws and measures enacted by the Third Reich. Some of them would eventually go into battle against that regime. It seems safe to assume also that on that sunny afternoon in Long Branch, beaming at the camera, the young men were aware of the assertive, maybe even defiant quality of the team's name, the Jewish Aces, 
the implications of aces, superior, raffish, primary, sensual, worldly, singular or lone, victorious, adept, also fit David. In such impure, fluid, partly accidental manifestations, certain human doings continue as nodes of energy, durably complex particles that radiate, shift, and recombine to exceed likelihood and evade prediction. King David, like the six-pointed design he would not have recognized, gathers meaning in a systole and diastole of need and invention over centuries of attainment and outrage, suffering and ordinary life in an endlessly glamorous, stubborn accretion. Thank you, Robert. Thank you. The floor is open to questions, comments, uh, uh, responses of various kinds. Yes. Can you come to the microphone because we're, the event is being recorded and we want to hear what everyone has to say? I can repeat questions too if others don't are shy Anything. to do that. that the answer to my question is already contained in some of your remarks, but um, I wanted uh, to know if you could comment on uh, the importance of the human voice as uh, the medium of poetry. When you uh, first launched the Favorite Poem Project, I started thinking about what my favorite poem might be. And um, all of the poems that originally came to my mind were poems that I had memorized as a child. Now, did I memorize them because they were my favorites or did they become my favorites because I memorized them? I don't know. But um, you were talking about uh, you know, the voice as being kind of an, uh, an embodiment a or re, a re-embodiment of the mm -hmm. original spirit, you might say, or spirit's a good word because it means breath in Latin. Okay, uh, of say the Whitman poem, mm -hmm. and um, you know, especially at a moment uh, in history where we're shifting our media and uh, you know technology, um, you know, poetry was originally. Uh, spoken, I believe, and I was just wanting to know if you could talk about voice and poetry, the human voice, the spoken voice. An important distinction for me is that it is a vocal art, though not necessarily a performative art. And in a culture where, as I've said, performance is so central, it's a very important distinction. Okay. When you memorize those poems, you incorporated them. You took them into your body, quite literally, you know, as in that of the Bradbury novel where certain people have memorized certain poems. Right. That person's body is that book. Um, the poem, in my opinion, is something that happens. It takes place each time someone reads it. It is like a piece of music. It happens each time. It's been, uh, there's notation that represents it, but it's something that happens in the course of a certain amount of time. It takes place. It takes place in a literal or imagined voice. So the vocality is not an ornament. It is not part of as of show business. As a category of show business, poetry will always be kind of cute and, and pet, trivial. As an art, it's immense and central. And uh, its nature is vocal. It's intellectual as well, as in the pound metaphor of the uh, uh, centaur. But it is also essentially vocal. And uh, I really do, uh, I, I suppose I'm promoting my product, but the DVD, you've only gotten a glimpse of it, um, the DVD that is in that book, uh, Invitation to Poetry, is for me, I can't tell you how glad I am that teachers can get it. To me, it's a great teaching tool. The teacher can show the kids not a tape of uh, a professor talking about the poem, or Sir John Gielgud reading Shakespeare, or of an act, uh, a rap artist doing a skillful, or the poet with a great personality. It's anyone at all who loves the poem. 
and that to me is very important in the nature of the art. I, I encourage you to sort of meditate your questions. Raise your hands when you're ready. While, while we're waiting for more energy from the audience, I have a question. Uh, you mentioned uh, Ivor Winters a little while ago, Robert, and uh, he, he was certainly the most compelling teacher I ever experienced. And Robert and I were at Stanford together at a period when this a astonishing poet critic was a very important influence on anyone who came within 100 miles of Stanford. I wonder if you'd talk a little bit about Winters and how you uh, see him now from the, in many ways your your career uh, is not congenial to what Winters might have imagined for you I think. In I don't some think that's so necessarily much. true. Uh, I remember one time that uh, our, our, another teacher we had, Bud Pfeiffer, a wonderful man who taught the 18th century, described reading applications with Winters and Bud Pfeiffer said I, I thought I was going to please him, his intellectual side, and I said ah, look at this woman, she says the main part of poetry for her is the sounds of the words and Winter said, that's pretty much right. <laughs> <laughs> and Bud Pfeiffer said, oh, well, uh, yes, I guess it is. Um, and uh, what I remember very well is Winter's reading, particularly in French, very beautiful. He had a rather beautiful voice. He said about his own work in poetry, what I did was small but good. And he wrote beautiful little poem. This is a poem by Ivor Winters, a summer commentary. When I was young, with sharper sense, the farthest insect cry I heard could stay me. Through the trees, intense, I watched the hunter and the bird. Where is the meaning that I found? Or was it but a state of mind, some old penumbra of the ground, ground in which to be, but not to find? Now, summer grasses, brown with heat, have crowded sweetness through the air. The very roadside dust is sweet. Even the unshadowed earth is fair. The soft voice of the nesting dove and the dove in swift erratic flight like a rapid hand within a glove caressed the silence and the light. Beautiful last stanza. Amid the rubble, the fallen fruit, fermenting in its rich decay, smears brandy on the trampling boot and sends it sweeter on its way. Amid the rubble, the fallen fruit fermenting in its rich decay smears brandy on the trampling boot and sends it sweeter on its way. That sense of scale, uh, uh, it's uh, very beautiful. And uh, David and I were fortunate to study with a real artist who is also a very learned man. I think his work lived. I think people still, other celebrity critics of the time, seemed to me absolutely forgotten. I haven't, only I remember there was someone named Cleanth Brooks. Uh, whereas I think Winters, uh, people are still quoting him and arguing with him. And he did leave write those poems uh, that um, are terrific. Not a great, great poet, but he wrote beautiful things like that. His emphasis was very powerfully rationalist. Uh, his great collection of critical writings was called In Defense of Reason. Uh, and he was often uh, complained against for uh, emphasizing the rational so intensely that the emotional dimension of, of poetry uh, was given, uh, according to these complaints, uh, 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 in inadequate acknowledgement in Winter's account. I take it you don't agree, Robert. He was very irritated by some of his adherents. Remember, he, I, I, I may have been the one who asked him about what he made of the fact that so many nuns came to study with him and took his courses. And he did look very, he said, what in the world do they think I'm saying? <laughs> um, he was, you know, he had his blindnesses, um, but um, he did not just say the poems were only rational. No. He was very interested in the interplay between the things I've been talking to you about. Uh, he had his limitations. Uh, I, and I'm proud to say that David and I were not amongst the robots. Uh, we were willing to argue with him that there was a lot to be said on behalf of Yeats as compared to T. Sturge Moore, right. while others were just saying, yeah, okay, it's T. Sturge Moore, greater. One of the things Robert and I did when we were in graduate school, we, Winters was famous for making um, obiter dicta judgments of poets he disliked. So he would say things like, Wordsworth is a, is a marginal figure. 
You know, he would, he was, and he would, often, he would often choose, you know, iconic figures. He would say, Shakespeare's sonnets are not what they're cracked up to be, he would say. He would say things like that. And he would, and he would also, also celebrate or, or, or uh, um, uh, argue for poets no one had ever heard of, often with ridiculous names, very comical names like Barnaby Googe and <laughs> Adelaide Crapsey was another one of the poets that Winters, Winters defended. And uh, um, uh, at one point, because we were sort of you know, arrogant graduate students, Robert and I collaborated on a parody of Winters in which I wrote the prose and Robert wrote all the poetry. Uh, and it was a it was a sort of fake Winters essay in which we in which we created in which we created a typical Winters poet who was virtually uh, uh, unknown. I think what well, his, his well, you left out Jones Ferry. That's right. Jones well, Ferry was one of the colonial discoveries. And actually, Jones he, Ferry wrote poem, some interesting right. poems. Uh, so one of one of Winters' favorites. Jones Ferry was a very Jones early 18th century American poet. I mean, I've, I've learned since it's actually pronounced Jonas Ferry, but it's Jones Ferry. See it spelled, and uh, Jones Ferry was one of Winters' great discoveries. And amongst other, he had couplets at the bottom of the page in all his poems. And one of the couplets was, "I now I'll read it in the Winter's voice. I now repose my weary head upon my pillow, but I shall be shortly gone." Not bad, though well. a little gloomy. <laughs> um, and our poet was called Smith Extremely. <laughs> And, and Robert wrote a series of comical little poems. I wish I had the text here. The that paraphrase, the rational paraphrase of all the poems, one was a sonnet, one was an elegy, I wrote them in all forms, and all of them basically said, I put a seedless roll into my lunchbox. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I wish I could find this manuscript. I think it would be worth something now because of Robert's poem. The only one we remember is the couplet. <laughs> I now insert a seedless roll into my lunchbox, but I shall be shortly through. <laughs> so, <laughs> I remember reading this to another colleague of a, of a professor that we both liked very much, a great, a great man in his own right, who had been a student of Winters himself, uh, Albert Gerard. And Gerard loved this parody, but he warned us never to let Winters see it. And I, to my knowledge, he never saw it. We were so scared that uh, all, all copy, all, uh, there are no extant copies. <laughs> Unless you've been hiding. Well, I have one, but I can't find it. I'm gonna... <laughs> Question. Question. OK. Then you'll be second. In English language poetry, there is no thick rhyme whatsoever anymore. Uh, you are suffering. The we, question we, is we, why in this day and the age in the uh, English language is there no rhyme and, uh, anymore? Um, you're not the only person to have that misapprehension. I think that uh, Joseph Brodsky, who wrote so many awful poems in English, uh, also had that notion that he was the only one writing in rhyme and meter. Uh, many people do, some very well. Tom Gunn uh, wrote great poems, wonderful poems. Uh, a uh, beautiful elegy for his uh, 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 brother in uh, uh, a poem inviting his, his brother to suffer. But, uh, Tom wrote uh, beautifully in couplets. Uh, he is only one example. So it's not the case. You know, I, David's been talking about an explanation for America. Uh, I broke my neck writing that poem in iambic pentameter. Uh, and um, the shirt poem that I read to you, Shirt, is also in the measure of uh, uh, iambic pentameter. And rhyme in English uh, was, not, was considered vulgar by writers like Milton because the classical languages didn't rhyme. So it's a more complicated question than it appears to be. And the fact that there are a lot of people who are writing free verse badly, or not really verse at all, shouldn't obscure the fact that it's possible to write rhyme and meter quite badly, too. As I, 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 I'm afraid <laughs> it all depends. Yes, sir. As a practitioner of maybe the most humanistic of the arts, the poetry, you've just finished an opera about a man who wants to be a robot, and it's introduced by robots. Does that horrify you, the idea that someone would wish to be a machine? Uh, do you think that, that robots will ever be able to write poetry uh, the same way that humans would? The character, in the character's mind, he's doing the opposite of becoming a machine. He's freeing himself from the... Uh, 
fungible, mortal machine of the body, he's leaving matter. He thinks he's becoming pure spirit. And uh, the word robot, as I understand it, is a Czech word originally. It means worker, thing that works. Uh, in that sense, we all aspire to be robots. We all, to get our work done is, is one of the great human pleasures. I don't think it's that simple. I do want very much with that story to raise questions like the questions you're asking. Uh, whether, uh, I mean, there are characters, I'd make a joke of it in the opera, but they're also serious. There are characters, three characters named the United Nations, the United Way, and the Administration uh, come to Simon and say, what about the starving of the earth? What about people who are suffering? Uh, you've already upset the world economy by putting all your resources into this project. And in the script, it does say there is a pageant, a parade of the starving and suffering of the earth, people who don't have enough to eat or water, people who have terrible diseases, children. And there's, we somehow put that on stage. I don't know how we put it on stage. Uh, it's more, almost more of a social question as, as a philosophical one in the opera. I'm not unaware of the question, but I wouldn't boil it down to, he, oh, he wants to become a robot. I, didn't, I was very interested by the idea of robotics, very interested by the idea of being um, of thinking machines, and uh, of this idea that we are evolving away from the human container for intelligence, that intelligence itself will evolve into some other format, let's say. And uh, I didn't want to make a trite Frankenstein story out of it. I didn't want to say yet again, oh, you're overweening, it will come to a bad end. I wanted to make it more ambiguous than that. And the daughter character has a very, she's very ambivalent about this. And she has a strong social conscience and many misgivings. And uh, all through, including the bit you're here, here it, quotes, uh, it quotes that wonderful uh, Mae Swenson poem, uh, Body, my horse, my hound, what will I do? Who will I be? And she says, what, how will I remember without my forgetting? How will I live without my death? And um, I think those are important questions. But I, I don't want to answer them in a way that is merely uh, humanistic in some uh, uh, facile way. So it's, 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 it's smoky. Down yes, here. sir. We have in the front here. Uh, two things by way of introduction to my question. Uh, I want to cover what you just said. Um, from my limited knowledge, um, Robot is a Czech word that was popularized, if not invented, by Karl Čapek yes. in How You Are. Uh, anyway, that's besides the point. The question I had, uh, you kind of um, threw me off. Uh, David, I don't know your last name, Professor. This is David, David Thorburn. Is I'm sorry, okay. okay. You said that um, uh, Dr. Pinsky's um, David was a point of departure for him. I think those were your words. Uh, as though he was creating something new for himself. Um, I take mild exception, and I could be wrong. No, I think you may be right. Because, I he mean. He would agree with you. In Dr. Think. Pinsky's poem about, a uh, longish poem about Daniel, okay, I see a lot of uh, biblical adherence, and yet a certain um, um, personal creativity of his own building on what the Bible offers about Daniel and you know, giving it a lot more, a lot more cloth. And um, also, in something as disparate, uh, a precursor from that is his poem about the child Jesus. And so I, if you yes. put those two uh, yin and yangs together, if you will, I think they both form a precursor to the current David. Completely. From the Childhood of Jesus is a model for the David book. And uh, it's based on uh, the Infancy Gospel of Thomas and other, other parts of the apocryphal book of Thomas. And the idea of apocrypha, the idea of midrash, those are very uh, interesting ideas to me. It seems to me that retellings, redactions, improvisations, at what point does the star get attached to him? At what point do the Psalms get attached to him? In what way? Uh, Jesus in these tellings becomes rather a brat. Uh, unlike in the uh, uh, Christian scriptures, he, we see him between infancy and adolescence. And he's a very difficult child who only Joseph has authority over him. This human quality of retelling, of giving another version, uh, seems to me one of the many 
points of nexus between art and human behavior. Art is not, it's art is continuous with things that people do all day. Uh, we make little mini works of art famously in our dreams, but when you're trying to be amusing to someone in a phone conversation, or when friends try to have fun at a party, when you choose colors for your living room, or when you we do our grooming, there are little works of art. And uh, a character like Daniel or Jesus or David, the biblical part is only a part of all the tremendous encrustation of human thought and feeling that is built around that thing. And uh, it's deeply human. And uh, I'm, I'm endlessly interested in that phenomenon. And yeah, I think of uh, my book about David as being a stone that I add to this huge human monument of all the things that people, the movies, the midrashes, the commentaries, the attacks, the, the bizarre exculpations people invented for the terrible things he does as to Uriah the Hittite. So a certain number of scholars make up absolutely bizarre stories uh, and theories. To uh, you know, Uriah the Hittite looks like a straight arrow, a nice guy in the Bible, but really, uh, he had the key to Goliath's armor, and Goliath was covered with armor. David couldn't cut his he head off because of the armor. So um, uh, Uriah said, "Well, I have the key, but uh, I'll give you the key if you give me a beautiful Israelite bride." So he wasn't entitled to Bathsheba anyway. It's hard to believe that some of these sages were not, uh, did not have any access to marijuana. <laughs> um, that is all part of the process of retelling and telling again and bringing out the uh, nefarious and sinister uh, aspects of the story. Uh, stories as great as these read us. Jesus reads us. David reads us. Each telling reads whoever reads it. That's what I mean by a story of stories. And I'm very interested in that process where the book reads you, then you read the book back and forth endlessly. Way back. Uh, let's say it's 2070. Will, if the Republic survives, uh, will the Poet Laureate be propped up by structure or by subject? <laughs> it's 2070. Um, by structure, you're talking about uh, aesthetic structure. You're not talking about some social structure. Exactly. I'm talking about the structure, the format of one's, the structure of one's work. For me, it will begin with the human body. Is there, is, is there a way that someone will want to say again the words that another person made? I chose to say you words that Winters put together. Uh, I chose this afternoon to put words, uh, say words that Frank O'Hara and uh, 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 Thomas Nash put together in the 20th and in the 16th century. Um, my strongest ambition is that 100 years from now, uh, some woman who's studying English in Tanzania or Uganda or Belize or Thailand will choose to say words that I put together. And in 2070, I think Poet Laureate is not important. It's uh, just a sort of a, it's a title. But if there is a poet who, uh, as I have gotten inspiration from Frank O'Hara, Emily Dickinson, Ivor Winters, whatever the things are I've read, uh, I'm hoping that uh, it's the centaur. I'm hoping that both, that the person looks around, has feelings, and says, I'm gonna, uh, I'm gonna express these feelings by the sounds of the words. And uh, if, if I'm one of the models, that's much more important than Poet Laureate. Over here. I, I found it to be very moving when you talked about the Use the microphone. I mean, so it, I'll repeat what she says. All right. I found it to be very moving what you said about the difficulty of writing a good poem. But um, it's also true that not all poets feel that. Um, that some poets have found it easy. Yes. Um, to write, or at least that there are periods yes. uh, when people have a tremendous outflowing of work. So I was wondering, do you feel that hardness? First of all, have you ever had a period that was like that? And do you feel that that hardness has to do with you personally, with the kind of work that you're trying to make, or what? The question has to do with my saying that it's so hard to write a good poem. 
And the questioner rightly points out that um, some poets have said, found it easy, or there are times in a career when people find it easy. Frank O'Hara said, I like to play the typewriter after breakfast for an hour or so. Um, it's like this. You have to climb a mountain, find your way through a maze, get to the field that has a tree in it. You climb up to the top of the tree, and you wait for a thunderstorm. Then it's easy once you're hit by lightning. <laughs> it's a computer game. To get hit by lightning, to get hit by lightning, once you're hit by lightning, no problem. I'm hit by lightning. Uh, but you go through a lot of uh, school food before you can get there. And um, you know, you listen to, uh, listen to that famous thing where Illinois Jaquette played Flying Home at the Newport Jazz Festival. And it sounds like, it sounds so exciting. And it also sounds like he just, he's breathing. He's having sex, he's eating. He's just doing something, you know, it's no problem. He had to learn to play this major and minor scales in all keys. He, you know, you don't pick up a saxophone and just blow it. He studied. He, he, he understands the harmonic structure of that rather simple blues-like harmonic structure, chord, chord progression. A lot goes, you work real hard to get to where it's easy. But Robert, in a related aspect to that question, it struck me as you were talking, the comment that you made, one, Robert was commissioned to write a poem about 9-11 by the Washington Post. It's a beautiful poem. And it was reprinted in the best American poems of whatever year it was. And the poets are asked to make a comment in it. And Robert's comment was interesting because he says, because this was an assignment, people think this was hard. But then you say, not really. Talk about that a little. <laughs> you say, you know, people are surprised by this. Got me. Um, on some occasions, it's fun to say that it's very hard to write a good poem. <laughs> <laughs> on some occasions, it's fun to say it's not hard. Uh, I, I used to say, people would talk about uh, translating the inferno. And I would say translation is, uh, it's easy because it's impossible. If you're trying to do something impossible, it's a lighthearted enterprise. Because you know, there's no such thing. Um, an assignment. People say, so it must be difficult to write to assignment. In a way, an assignment uh, gives you the freedom of saying, got to do this. And uh, there's something a little bit liberating. It's like I use the same word, a word that I often find a can't word, the word liberating. I used it when I talked about working with Todd. Um, one of the human beings enjoy difficulty very much. And when you're doing the video game or playing golf or basketball or tennis or you're working on a new knitting pattern or building a boat or you have the software you're figuring out or you're solving a problem at work, you get to a point where it's neither difficult nor easy. It's just what you want to be doing. And it's hard to remember to eat or go to the bathroom because you just want to be doing that. And I think that is one of the most desired human states, that engaging a worthy difficulty difficulty worthy of yourself. And um, <laughs> I said that about that poem. And in recent weeks, in correspondence with somebody who wrote an essay about the poem, I've been revising it ever since. I think I may finally have it right. At one point, I took it out of my book. Uh, because frankly, I felt that um, you know, the, uh, I have to find out which Polish poet it is, Adam Zagajewski quoted as saying, during the Soviet years, the most ambitious poet was the state. They wanted to control all the metaphors. And I felt that, um, I felt quite frankly, I, 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 hate, I feel like I'm going to be preaching to the choir or something. I, I, I don't want this to be a big ha ah, line. But I felt that the Bush administration had so much taken over 9-11 that my poem had changed. And that uh, I was unhappy. I was unhappy to think that. Um, that the meaning of my poem is going to somehow accede to the use of this as a really preposterous political slogan. You know, like you're invading a country that had nothing to do with it, and well, we're fighting back. Back means you're supposed to fight the people who, you know, that it, I, I have gone through agony over that poem, which I, you remind me, I said in print it was easy to write. 
I've never spent so long revising a poem. And frankly, the woman, what the woman said about it described just the poem I want to have written. It included the ambiguity, and she, she felt I was going crazy, which could be true. I have revised the poem. I've revised the constantly. Look, the post version is different from the best American poetry ver version. The version that's been in my manuscript that I took out and put that in is different. She, this woman who wrote this beautiful essay about my poem, I emailed her the latest revision, which incorporates a lot of Catherine Lee Bates's uh, America the Beautiful near the end. I haven't heard from her. I she, think she thinks I screwed my poem up. <laughs> she, she She's been very afraid of me. She says, oh, I don't know what. She and may I've be been right. terrified of her. <laughs> she, she may be right. She may be right. One of the really remarkable things about Robert, I, I, uh, I mean, there are many things about him I admire, but uh, he published a poem in The New Yorker a, a couple of years ago, and I wrote him an email about it saying I didn't understand one part of it. And he wrote back saying, it bothers me a lot that this poem is not accessible. And he went and engaged in a process of revision. And he sent me some changes. Do you think this is any better? Uh, I'm not sure that the poem was really improved by his changes. But, but I know that the poem became clearer because of his changes. And it, it, it seems to me a very uh, meaningful comment on his way of working, that it matters to him to be understood. And I, I thought maybe, I know that you don't like to do this because in your position, you have to be friendly to all forms of poetry. But there really is a situation in the poetry world at large in which there is a, a vast ocean of material that's being written is written in a kind of mystical or obscurantist way in which no rational reader can make sense of it. Um, I'm wondering if you would be willing to say something about sort of the condition of poetry in that way. I think, I, I think one never knows what the condition of poetry is. You know, the day that Elizabeth Bishop wrote At the Fish Houses, which I consider a great poem, it didn't say the next day or the next week or so in Time Magazine, New York Times, or in Poetry Magazine. Last week, Elizabeth Bishop wrote At the Fish Houses, one of the best poems of the last 30, 40 years. You, know, you, you perceive these things over time. And uh, there's a moment at which Stephen Vincent Benet is a very important poet, and Elizabeth Bishop isn't, and then decades pass, and it becomes recast. So you don't know, you, you don't see the scene well. I do know that for many very young people, there is an available style that's very opaque. And you can see why it is attractive. Because in this opacity, you seem to be tormented, profound, dissatisfied with the limitations of language. And it's an armor against gaucherism. It's an armor against seeming naive. It's an instant access to sophistication. And it's a too effective defense. You perfect a way of writing that seems to solve all problems. And this was true of some of Winter's disciples who wrote skill, will, must, trust. That also is a kind of a defense. Right. And I think that to do an art, you need to be vulnerable, especially when you're young. You need to be gauche. How can you ever get further if you don't manifest your gauchery? Uh, and so you think it's, you're saying it's protective, Robert? That yeah, I think so. I think it, you can see why, especially when there's lots and lots of people who want to write poetry, which is a good thing. But then they're afraid of being klutzy. I know that terror very well myself. And if there's an available style that protects you against seeming clumsy or unsure or uncertain, it's a great temptation, very attractive. Uh, I think you must risk seeming stupid. And I feel it every time I, I write, that I am risking seeming stupid, self sad and whatever bad thing you're worried about, uh, banal. Uh, you know, I, I, I was excessively defensive when this gentleman asked me about the humanistic uh, meaning of this. I, I, because I'm thinking, on the one hand, uh, do I want to too glibly say we must be humanists and not be uh, ro robots? On the other hand, do I want to make two? Uh, you can see that in either way, there's a, there's a pitfall. And you have to confront your own ambivalence. And believe me, it's much worse for me than for a 20-year-old. 19 or 20-year-old kid writes something stupid. So it's 19, I, I, you know, you wrote something stupid. I write something stupid. Robert fucking Pinsky <laughs> wrote something stupid. <laughs> so if anybody at all has heard of you, the stakes go up. And um, 
if you don't feel any of that, for me anyway, I know you're right, it, there are times when you say it's easy, but you have to feel some of that. And I think that all styles of the period, probably always, have an element in them of here's a way to seem to have done it. And right now, it's a way to seem not to have, it's a way to defend yourself. Very easy, very available. Instant sophistication. You don't even have to have read very much, and you can seem sophisticated by adopting this uh, manner. Is that okay? That was good. It wasn't. A, it wasn't exactly an answer to the question. Tell you a David better. Thorburn story. It was, we I don't know if we need. I don't know if we need this. We were the two guys at Stanford. <laughs> we were the two guys at Stanford from New Jersey. He had gone to Princeton. I had gone to Rutgers, and um, they actually got us mixed up a lot. I've been very proud of this most of my life. They, people would confuse us. We didn't look particularly alike, we didn't sound, but we were the two smart guys from New Jersey or something. And um, they were mostly Westerners. And one day I was stopped at a traffic light in my car, and a car full, a convertible full of fellow graduate students pulled up. And as the light was changing, one of the women in the car was very close to me, looked at me and said, well, hello, Mr. La Brain Thorburn. <laughs> <laughs> well, I can't top that story. <laughs> Actually, I do have a, a, a story about our confusion, though. It may, maybe it does top it. Uh, well, uh, when we when we came no out. Doubt. Of, when we came out of graduate school, we went for interviews at various places. This is an impossible situation for contemporary academics to imagine, but there were hundreds of jobs available. We were very, we were very sought after. We were offered many jobs. The University of Chicago offered me a job, which I turned down to go to Yale. The University of Chicago called Robert and offered him a job, and they said That's to Harvard. him, Harvard. It was Harvard. And they, called, they called Robert, and they said to Robert, well, you, you can have this job. We, we'd like you to come there to write about my dissertation topic. The Harvard was confusing. I got a letter from the so chairman of the So he refused them on this basis. We'd like you to come here, and among other things, we'd like you to teach one of your uh, favorite subjects, perhaps Conrad and the Sea Tale. Which I had, which was my, which was my dissertation. <laughs> this reinforced what Winters said to me. Winters said, don't take the job at Yale or at Harvard. Those places are traps for young people. And then when I read the Conrad thing, I said, maybe he's right. <laughs> So now I can say, people say, well, you teach at Harvard, right? I say, no, my only relation to Harvard was I once turned a job down there. Right. right. <laughs> it, it is a, it, it's actually probably a rarer group of people who can say they turned a job down for, at Harvard than, than uh, people who have accepted jobs. It's an uh, impressive thing. Uh, uh, Robert, Robert. One of my, amongst my credentials. One of, one of, <laughs> one of Robert's most remarkable credentials. Well, I, I think uh, well, I, I, there, there was a, a poem of Robert's I was hoping to have him read at a conclusion. So uh, a couple more questions, if there are any, and then I, I think I'd like, Robert, do you, do you, do you have copies of the uh, chapbook with you? I have. Could you do, could you do door? You. Sure. OK. Any final questions or comments? There's a, uh, uh, the, the, the chapbook that is about to appear uh, um, in, in a month or two, uh, a question here. Yes, good. Twenty minutes ago, recited a line that had to do with had to do with memory. Yes. And um, and it, I, I've been watching our culture, well, forever, or my version of forever, fifty three years. And but I've really noticed over the last fifteen to twenty years, what an odd way. Um, and I think it's not all Anglo Saxon cultures. I think it's particularly American this very weird relationship we have with memory. Actually, I'm struck by more our relationship to forgetting. And um, I, I just wondered if you could speak to that, because the, when you said, um, uh, or you described the moment when someone's words have impacted you enough that you want to say those same words again, that's a moment that I recognize in my life, not just from reading, but I remember specific moments hundreds of them when my brother or a friend said something that was yes. so perfect that I've repeated it a hundred times. And it's, it's part of the meaningfulness of my own life. And I feel at the same time I look around me and get the feeling that I'm in a culture that's desperate to forget as much as it can and obliterate as much as it can. And I, I can't quite pull that all together. And I'm wondering how you do. I've thought of, uh, I've thought of calling my new manuscript 
the book of forgetting. And um, a line in one of the poems has to do with forgetting being a form of memory. Forgetting is a particularly disturbing form of memory. Um, I'm going to, in response to your question, I'm going to read a poem other than the one David wanted me to read. I'll read the other one as well. Oh, gosh. I'll, I'll, read, I'll read both. This is a poem that is probably at the far end of being hard to understand for some of my friends. Uh, I'm still not sure what I'm going to entitle it. It's this phenomena of things being forgotten culturally. Um, poor Burt Williams, W.C. Fields, Eddie Cantor, all those early comics, the Zigfield comics said the most inventive, the best writer, the best performer was Burt Williams. Burt Williams was a black man. He could only work in blackface. He tried working without the blackface. He was a rather light-skinned black man, and it didn't work for him. So it was not a demeaning character. His character, you can, on the web, you can pick up things like you can, you can buy him singing his, uh, his song, Nobody. When I'm in trouble, I know that how I can rely on nobody. Uh, anyway, he's just one example. And uh, cultural forgetting, as well as personal forgetting, is something I'm interested in. Um, and I think in a first draft, this poem is called I've Never Heard Of. One of my friends suggested calling it what is now the title Louis Louis. Uh, but probably a lot of people under a certain age even have forgotten Louis Louis. And it's that phenomenon. And then there are expressions people forget. How many people here have ever heard the expression white Catholic? One person. How many people have ever heard the expression white Jew? Nobody. You can guess what they mean, though, right? Somebody who seems more like a wasp, but they happen to be Jewish or Catholic. I was at Notre Dame when I first, I had heard white Jew since I was a child. At Notre Dame, I was talking to a kid who explained that his parents were on the board of the symphony in the Midwestern city he came from, and he said, uh, I'm what you call a white Catholic. That is, it's not a a working class family. It's a very uh, uh, tennis playing kind of family. Um, I'll read this poem, then I'll read the poem Door. That they, is that so okay? Does that sound good to I have heard of black Irish, but I never heard of white Catholic or white Jew. I have heard of is poetry popular, but I never heard of Lawrence Welk drove Sid Caesar off television. I have heard of Kwanzaa, but I have never heard of Burt Williams. I have never heard of Will Rogers, or Roger Williams, or Buck Rogers, or Pearl Buck, or Frank Buck at Yale, or Frank Buck, or Frank Merriwell at Yale. I have heard of Yale, but I never heard of George W. Bush. I have heard of Harvard, but I never heard of Numerous Clausus, which sounds to me like a, some kind of pig Latin. How many people here know what numerous clauses is? Two. There's a secret number that until a couple of decades ago, the secret percentage of Jubies, Jews, that were allowed into Yale or Harvard or Princeton. Numerous clauses. I have heard of Yale, but I never heard of George W. Bush. I've heard of Harvard, but I never heard of numerous clauses, which sounds to me like some kind of pig Latin. I have heard of the pig boy. I have never heard of the Beastie Boys or the Scottsboro Boys. How many people here have heard of the Scottsboro Boys? Almost a third, almost a half. I have heard of the Beastie Boys or the Scottsboro Boys. I've never heard of the Beastie Boys or the Scottsboro Boys, but I have heard singing boys. What they were called, I forget. I have never heard America singing, but I have heard of I Hear America Singing. I think it must have been a book we had in school. I forget. I suppose it's a poem. It's almost in the poem, the person I'm scold in the person of who I'm scolding, but it's also in the person of myself. There's a perverse Pinsky who comes out in poems like this. I think. Um, in one of his poems, he has one poem that sort of. Uh, is a disobedient adolescent, an angry adolescent, is the, 
uh, the poem uh, calls itself. I feel like I basically remain an angry adolescent, which I certainly was. And um, it's amazing that some of it goes down. <laughs> um, shall I close with this? Yes. Maybe give, maybe give it back to explain where it comes from. There's a sequence of poems that are, it's called, it's, it was what the chapbook would be. It will be, it's come back to come out. It's called First Thing to Hand, First Things to Hand. And the theory of the, is that the first thing I touch has to be the occasion for a poem. So it would be uh, my US Airways preferred dividend miles card. And uh, you would uh, talk about plastic, and this one is before they put the, um, magnetic uh, strip on it. It's delaminating. And the layers of what's happening to uh, uh, labor and health plans from airlines uh, that whoever was in charge of laminating this, uh, the person who invented it, I hope they made money, but the, it's the clear plastic that makes it glossy is delaminated, blah, blah, blah. And the point is, not ordinary life is so interesting, but that the occasion for a poem is never really its subject. O to a nightingale is not about a bird. Uh, sailing to Byzantium is not about Byzantium. They're about all the things Keats felt about life that day, all the things that uh, Yeats was feeling about life that day. And if each of us wrote a poem about the uh, little plastic card, each poem would express the personality and the obsessions and the concerns of that person. If we even just wrote a paragraph describing it, we would be writing the things that mattered to us. So there's a poem called Book, there's one called Newspaper, there's one called Jar of Pens, uh, there's one called Other Hand, because it's the next thing you touch. And uh, what time are we supposed to finish? Right up? now, when you finish this. <laughs> this is Door. Door. The cat cries for me from the other side. It is beyond her to work this device that I open and cross and close with such ease when I mean to work. Its four panels form a cross, the rood, impaling gatepost of redemption, the rod, a dividing pike or pail mounted and hinged to swing between one place and another, meow, between the January vulva of birth and the January of death's door, there are so many to negotiate, closed or flung open or ajar, valves of attention. Oh, kitty, if the doors of perception were cleansed, all things would appear as they are, infinite. Come in, darling, drowse comfortably near my feet. I will click the barrier closed again behind you. Oh, sister Will. Fellow mortal, here we are. Thank you, Robert. Thank you, audience.